So thank you very much. So I'm Ilan Kelman. I'm half here at the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. And I'm half at the UCL Institute for Global Health. So it is sort of a gamble regarding which half of me you get on any given day. And today I'm going to be talking about disaster diplomacy in this context of risk across borders, risk without borders, risk through borders. And we start with the usual day of 26 December 2004. A massive shallow earthquake off the coast of Indonesia shatters in morning. Indigenous people on the island of Similu, right beside the epicenter, know exactly what is coming next. So they run for the hills with a remarkably low mortality rate. Others are not so lucky within minutes across Aceh, Indonesia, over 130,000 people have died, including Indonesian soldiers fighting the Achenese separatists and Achenese separatists who were trapped in their prison cells and could not escape. The tsunami crosses the Indian Ocean, slamming into over a dozen countries causing fatalities, including Sri Lanka, the second worst hit country, over 35,000 dead. And like Aceh, subject to a long-standing conflict, which had become particularly violent over the past three decades. The world slowly wakes up to this devastation. Facebook had just started, and Twitter did not exist. Those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> but videos of the waves ripping through the tourist resorts soon appeared on the 24-hour news channels. Away from those tourist resorts, though, the places most ruined were those least accessible by the outside world. Aceh had been off limits, and Sri Lanka, the worst hit areas, had been too dangerous. But yet, from the devastation, a remarkable consequence emerged. A month later, on 23rd January 2005, Achenese fighters in the Indonesian government started peace talks in Helsinki. On 15 August that year, a peace deal was signed, and it has so far lasted. Apparently, we have disaster diplomacy, except that across the ocean, in Sri Lanka, the situation was deteriorating. Humanitarian aid was being blocked by many parties in the conflict. They appeared to be just spoiling for a fight, despite their citizens desperately needing humanitarian aid. As Aceh's peace deal was being finalized, Sri Lanka's foreign minister was assassinated. And three months later, Sri Lanka elected a president explicitly opposed to a peace deal. Four years more of bitter fighting until the Sri Lankan government reached a military victory. So why the difference? Did Aceh's peace deal really come from the tsunami? Did the exacerbation and continuation of Sri Lanka's conflict, was that caused by the tsunami? Well, to try and investigate this question, we asked the overarching disaster diplomacy query about how and why disaster-related activities do and do not influence peace and cooperation. So disaster-related activities, it's not just post-disaster. Yes, we had the humanitarian summit yesterday. Yes, we heard about post-disaster financing this morning. That is an important element of disaster diplomacy. But we also have to think about the fact we are the Institute for Risk, and disaster reduction, and today is about risk with borders, across borders, through borders, without borders, not just disaster response. So disaster diplomacy does examine pre-disaster activities, disaster risk reduction, mitigation, prevention, preparedness, and planning. That's the good news. The bad news is that we've investigated dozens of studies from around the world Recent, such as the 6 February 2023 earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, and ancient, going back a thousand years, if not more. We've looked at different geographies in terms of within countries, and of course across countries, bilateral and multilateral. We've considered different hazards, raising, ranging from earthquakes to haze from forest fires, but also recognizing that the key to disaster is not the hazard, it's the vulnerability. So we've considered different vulnerabilities, such as discrimination in disaster aid, such as prejudice 
through disaster risk reduction, such as what happens when racism infiltrates disaster casualty identification. And across all of these dozens of case studies throughout humanity, we have yet to find a single clear success for disaster diplomacy. So why does disaster diplomacy fail across all forms, all houses, all vulnerabilities, all geographies, all locations? Well, the answer really comes in the general patterns that we witness. So disaster-related activities have not yet been shown to generate new, lasting, genuine diplomacy. What disaster-related activities do achieve, both post-disaster and pre-disaster, is supporting, influencing an ongoing process. So it can catalyze, it can spur on, it can affect people, organizations, institutions, governments who want peace or conflict for other reasons, and then they use disaster-related activities as one excuse among many for achieving that diplomacy or rapprochement or cooperation or peace or conflict or war goal, which they wanted anyway. What are those pre-existing bases? Well, it might be secret negotiations. Could be ongoing trade or desire that money and economics are much more important than lives. We know that doesn't happen too often, but that can be a pre-existing basis. Certainly cultural links pre-existing links, either historical, cultural, sports, arts, entertainment, all can spur on, can influence, can bring in disaster-related activities towards those diplomatic processes. But when this catalysis does happen, when we do see that, see that clear influence of disaster on diplomacy, it is inevitably short-term, basically on the order of weeks or months. And in the longer term, when we get to years, other factors simply take over and supersede whatever happened regarding the disaster-related activities. These other factors, leadership changes. Other disasters, including possible conflicts, or too often, sadly, the inertia of historical dislike. You've only been here 300 years. Why do you call this home? You don't belong here. And then a disaster happens or there's disaster aid and these prejudices, this discrimination simply recurs and perpetuates irrespective of what's going on with respect to the disaster. So how bleak is this? Well, we do know that it's very difficult to be entirely comprehensive. As I said, we've looked at dozens of examples of all forms. Dozens is not hundreds. And we have many possibilities of ongoing work which may yet yield disaster diplomacy successes. So for those students who might be looking for a dissertation, <laughs> we certainly have ideas for you to investigate going into historical archives, uh, doing research by interviewing people who were actually there at the time, those who were the decision makers, or just trying to improve the concepts that we've come up with. The fundamental basic challenge, which comes from disaster diplomacy, is judge to just say the obvious, as we heard before, that fundamentally, disaster-related activities are not necessarily a political priority. Oh, I didn't give a trigger warning. I hope that wasn't a shock to anyone. <laughs> that sometimes politicians may be aiming for something more than saving the lives of the people that sometimes politicians may want something more than actually stopping a disaster and helping their country, something more as in ideology, as in power, as in consolidating the resources which they have already, and no disaster and no disaster risk reduction is going to stop them from achieving their own personal political goals. These really put another way, Politics can simply be uncaring. I don't think this is an innovative insight, but it is sometimes forgotten, particularly in the media and humanitarian rush, to say, oh, disasters happen. We have to help them. We're all going to hold hands and sing a song, Kumbaya, at midnight while dancing in a circle. Some people want that. 
but often those with the power don't. Just as we know, as I alluded to, disasters come from vulnerability, not hazard, not the environment. These those with power, resources, and opportunity inadvertently or deliberately seek disaster, want disaster, or simply don't care about disaster. What does this mean for humanitarianism? What does this mean for risk and disaster reduction? Can we be neutral? Can we be impartial? The seven principles which pervade many humanitarian organizations now moving into disaster risk reduction, as we heard this morning, is that actually feasible or is that an ideal dream? And ultimately, what does this mean for a specific example, like that devastating 26 December 2004 tsunami? There is no doubt in Ache that the earthquake, tsunami, the deaths and the devastation created the space whereby peace could happen if it were desired. There is no doubt that the events on that morning led the possibility of rebuilding better, of reaching a peace deal, of ending the conflict, if people wanted it. And it turned out that in Aceh, Indonesia, actually the people wanted it. Our research showed that the secret negotiations that led to those talks in Helsinki and ultimately the peace deal, those talks had started secretly on the 24th of December 2004, 48 hours before the earth shook. But no negotiation starts like that. Those talks appeared based on months of previous back and forth by leaders on the various sides who already wanted peace and were seeking any excuse to achieve it. So they used the earthquake, tsunami, the disaster, the humanitarian aid as one excuse among many to achieve that peace. Whereas in Sri Lanka, the main parties had very clear reasons for wanting the war. They gained from it. It helped consolidate the power, resources, and opportunities that they had. So they were looking for any excuse whatsoever to continue that conflict. And the tsunami, the disaster, the humanitarian aid gave them one excuse among many in order to continue that war. And they used it. So what do we do about it? And who is we anyway? Some of us are operational, some of us are not. But by virtue of being in this room, or online, we are privileged. And so is it our duty, is it our responsibility to say, if we just sit back and, you know, be researchers and say, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Well, yeah, people died. How, you know, let's tally that up. Are we really doing what we ought to be doing? Or do we have more of duty, responsibility, and obligation to be active to get involved, either using our PhD by becoming a practitioner or by doing both academics and practitionership, by saying, we know that disaster diplomacy might work. What can we do actively to ensure that it could work? And then what are the dangers of it backfiring? Imagine if we go in and say, oh, there's been a disaster with your enemy, and if you help them, you'll actually achieve peace. And the leader says, well, I don't want peace, so I don't care if they die under the rubble. I'm not giving humanitarian aid. Again, in humanitarianism, in risk and disaster reduction, is do no harm ever really feasible without knowing in advance? So who, who is a we? Are we perfectly complacent, perfectly content in our nice, I guess, purple ivory tower discussing this? Or should we be more active? Also thinking about the vocabulary and the words we use, I've just thrown out synonyms, right? Diplomacy, cooperation, rapprochement, collaboration. Those are actually very different and different disciplines, even within international affairs, international relations, disaster risk reduction, and others, actually define them quite differently, which means we're often talking at cross purposes, which in itself can cause problems. So when we do talk about risk, disasters, disaster risk reduction, with, across, without, in between, through borders and different types of borders, what is it that we want to achieve? And how are we going to ensure that we do actually achieve that without causing more problems, whether or not that is with or without disaster diplomacy? Thank you very much.
Do we have questions and a microphone, Jasmine? So we have a microphone, we have a Jasmine. Do we have questions? <laughs> Thanks very much. That was really illuminating talk. Um, I wondered how far you would see a loss and damage fund under the UN FCCC as an opportunity for some kind of disaster diplomacy. Well, loss and damage was first proposed by Vanuatu before the UN FCCC was even founded. We're now a generation on, and of course we've a wonderful agreement, but no money, and no mechanism for dispersing the money, and no one who's going to be actually responsible for the money. So I'm not optimistic about loss and damage. Other challenges with loss and damage, number one attribution. Remember, loss and damage is, for some bizarre reason, focused on only human-caused climate change and nothing else. But, you know, earthquakes cause loss and damage, and tsunamis do, and many other uh, hazards and hazard influencers. Number two, it is very top-down and very much from a certain class of countries. So they talk about climate justice, but there's an exceptional amount of academics, again, practical, who knows, but academics, to point out the colonialist and neo-colonialist approaches, interpretations, and results from taking a climate justice framework. Uh, and number three, then we need to think about loss and damage from colonialism, from the internet, from television, from tourism. And the final aspect is from the beginning of the recognition that human-caused climate change is a major problem, there is also recognition there's huge losses and damages which are happening now. Some actually benefit. There are some gains. And even in the UNFCCC and IPCC definitions of adaptation, it explicitly says climate change adaptation means exploit beneficial opportunities from climate change. So should we subtract the gains from the losses to achieve loss and damage? And none of these issues, in effect, are actually addressed by it. So yeah, I mean, the UN may have done some good, uh, has it actually achieved disaster diplomacy. We've not find and found an example. In the climate change negotiations, we've looked at them and really not found anything emerging beyond those climate change negotiations. And loss and damage right now has been a very uh, disappointing distraction, particularly because they're going for on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe up to billions of dollars a year. But fossil fuel subsidies every year exceed $400 billion a year. So let's say they get $200 billion a year, then that's actually paying them to take double that amount in direct subsidies. So we're not really achieving anything in the end, even if we get that loss and damage fund up on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. But in good news. I Uh, thank you very much. So you talked about how sort of disasters maybe have negative uh, or they help sort of patchwork negative impacts that are happening in the country already. Can you think of a positive example where a disaster has then led to better diplomacy afterwards after a disaster or hazard event in your experience? So we have many examples where it influenced and spurred on and that chase one. Another clear cut one is on the 17th of August 1999. An earthquake rocked northwest Tur Turkey, Turkey, killing over 17,000 people. Greece immediately offered assistance. Quite conveniently, three weeks later, Athens was shocked by an earthquake on the 7th of September 1999, which killed over 100 people. And it was actually Turkey's search and rescue team who rang the Greek ambassador in Ankara to say, your capital's in trouble, we will offer anything you need. And both countries suddenly said, well, this is how we're going to come together and actually create earthquake diplomacy, and there was great hope for that. Our research showed that that process had started three years earlier in 1996. So it definitely helped, definitely spurred it on, and we find this again and again and again, but it did not cause. The other element is disasters influencing elections. And again, we heard this morning about Mexico, and there is a whole field out there and many examples of how poor humanitarian relief or solid disaster response actually helped win a relatively free uh, or, or helped lose a relatively free, open and fair democratic election. Relatively, depends on the country. And so this is sort of an example where politicians might want to say, oh, it's an election, let's have a disaster. Uh, or try and use that conveniently, coincidentally, in order to do better. Now, of course, there's a number of moral issues. Why are they only helping after a disaster to win an election? Number two, shouldn't they do a lot better 
in terms of preventing the disaster and trying to be appropriate with politics. And number three, you asked for a positive outcome. When someone wins or loses an election, there's always people who think it's positive and people who think it's negative. So it's a balance. But the core of your question and the core of disaster diplomacy, why are we waiting for a disaster to lead to peace or positive politics? Why can we not just stop disasters happening and have positive peace and positive health and positive democracy and positive society without waiting for that catastrophe or potential catastrophe? And in a sense, why do we not support prevention is better than cure? Why do we not do better for ourselves and our society without even thinking about catastrophe is a question that maybe you want to think about over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> as well as beyond in your work, in your studies, in order to say we have major problems, let's do better. But thank you for being here. We are back, Rosanna, at 2.15. Two o'clock. So please come back. British summer time, 1400. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay.